with me the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read responsibly from Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to Thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of Thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against Thee, and Thee only, have I sinned. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me no wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Our second reading is from John 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not be enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, <coughs> Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. How far will they go among the many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. <clears throat> there was plenty of grass in that place. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the bread gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to one of his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley doughs left over by those who had eaten. After people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. John's Gospel is, to the minds of many, a gospel of signs and sayings. The story Marv just read, we all know it and love it, is listed by theologians as the fourth sign in John's Gospel that Jesus did to demonstrate the authenticity of his claim to be the Messiah of God. And just in case you're wondering, and I'm sure you are, uh, those seven signs are uh, changing water to wine in John 2, healing the Roman nobleman's son in John 4, healing the lame man, the man born lame uh, in John 5, this feeding of the 5,000. Uh, this is followed in chapter 6 by Jesus walking on the water. That's the fifth sign. And then there's another blind healing in John 9, and of course the uh, ultimate sign, the uh, raising of Lazarus from the dead. But I said also, it's, a, it's the gospel of sayings. Here are the things that Jesus said, the great I am statements. 
in John's Gospel. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And we're going to discuss one of those hard, one of those sayings this morning as a hard saying. Let's go back to what John, uh, Marv just read. What Marv read there is a snapshot, I think, of the zenith, the popular pinnacle of our Lord's earthly ministry. He was never more popular, never so widely and ambitiously and devotedly followed, never drew bigger crowds before and certainly not after. This is the moment. And this astonishing miracle, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I, I depict uh, Andrew walking up to Jesus with this little boy who has this little lunch pail. And you imagine a crowd standing around all over this natural amphitheater created by the mountainside. 5,000 men, scholars estimate there might have been as many as 10, 12,000 people, including women and children. And him coming up and says, well, here's a boy with five loaves and two fishes. And I wonder if I would have even done that. Philip didn't show a lot of faith when he was tested by Jesus. How will we, where can we go to buy bread to feed these people? And, and, and Philip's response was, well, mine would have been. Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding? We're penniless. It would take, what did he say, more eight months wages to give everybody a single bite of grub. And there's no place to what would the right, what would the, yeah, and the 7-Eleven is like way over there. <laughs> what would the right response have been, I've often asked myself. What did Jesus, who was testing Philip, what did he hope Philip would say? Something probably like, no Lord, only you know. Or Lord, you can provide. Or is this a trick question? Come on. You're the Son of God. You can do this. I don't know. But Andrew showed remarkable faith with this little boy. Here's, here's all the food I can find. Uh, how, I, don't, I don't think it'll go very far. And I'm trying to imagine, you must have done this too, what it was like to watch Jesus break the bread. Now he's breaking five loaves, and he keeps breaking five loaves, and he keeps breaking five loaves, and breaking the fish into pieces, and he keeps doing that until everybody has not just had Philip's bite, but have had all they can eat. I, I find this astonishing. Who could watch this and not have their lives completely transformed? Eric and I had a brief discussion last Sunday about the mystery it is to all of us that how long Jesus' disciples didn't believe. How long they held out having seen these astonishing things again and again. And so the 5,000 are fed and let's turn back to John 6. If you haven't turned there yet, please do. Uh, the tail end of what Marv read there, uh, verse 13 in John 6. Therefore, after Jesus told them to gather up the fragments, therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets. There's that number 12 again. It's repeated again and again in the Scriptures. 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, what men? The disciples or the 5,000? Well, in this case, it's the 5,000. Those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Who was the prophet? Capital P in your Bibles, most likely. Well, they began to think that this miracle of feeding, this miracle of bread multiplied to feed the congregation. They had one of two prophets in mind, I think. Either Elijah, who had at least two miracles admitted to him in regarding to feeding lots of people, one a hundred men with one loaf of bread. Or, and probably more likely, Moses, who most Jews in Christ's lifetime believed to be, have been the greatest prophet of God. Not only foretelling, but forthtelling God's word through the law. 
And in Deuteronomy, I won't take you there now, but in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, there is an allusion to the fact that God will provide a new Moses for his people. And looking back through the uh, annals of time from this side of the cross, we see that the writer of Deuteronomy was, whether well, they do it or not, pointing to Jesus Christ. And so there's, there's a, a, an epiphany here in some of the people, perhaps on the basis of this miracle particularly, perhaps this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Now that's interesting and fine and good, but it's the next verse that most intrigues me. Therefore, verse 15, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Jesus had a sense that the magnitude of this miracle was causing such a stir among the men who were drawing conclusions. You can hear, almost hear the buzz that maybe this is he. And they are ready to take him by force and make him their king. They were looking, as always, for somebody who would keep their bellies full and we shouldn't dismiss that. you got to understand this. In that culture, every single day for a huge majority of people was a struggle to get enough to eat. We are, so, we are so sloppy and wasted about that. We can eat whenever we want. I can remember vividly, maybe Wayne can too, we were vacationing in Europe. One of my favorite blessings of all time is getting a chance to do that. And we're Americans and we're traveling around and we're in these lovely small towns in, in, in France. And, uh, you know, it's, we're getting hungry. It's about 2 o'clock and we're hungry. And in America, if you're hungry, you can eat. If you got a dollar, you can buy a double cheeseburger in America. 24-7 if you like. So we go to a couple of, uh, uh, you know, eateries in these little towns. And well, we don't serve food again until till 5 o'clock. What? These people are so backward. They're so uncivilized. And we tried it several. We could get a drink. But you could not get any food until supper time. And I'm sure they're saying, you fat American. <laughs> Hello? We eat at lunch and not again until dinner. You Americans eat around the clock. Guilty. And so people in that culture who hardly ever had enough to eat had seen this miracle. They had always dreamed about manna, how God provided for the whole nation food without work. And so if this is the man who can feed us, Maybe he's the prophet, the one they talked about. And of course, they also wanted another need met, get rid of people they don't like. They wanted to make Jesus king. Why? We know why. To get rid of the Romans. They really felt Messiah would be political, that he would come and fix everything to everybody's liking. I think we've learned enough to know that that is not necessarily true. Anyway, long story short, i got to fly here. Uh, there's a story inter interspersed here with Jesus walking on water. Uh, it isn't the throwaway. Jesus, trying to get by himself, uh, had gone to the mountainside. The disciples were going to fish, I assume. They waited for Jesus. We aren't sure where they were going. Maybe Capernaum. And Jesus didn't show up until about uh, 4 o'clock. They said, we better go without him. So they went out to see. It's a storm brewing. By the way, the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Gennesaret, is not a lake. It's, we would call it almost an ocean. It's like a great lake. It's... It's seven feet wide at this point. You can't see the other shoreline. It's like going out into a, into a small ocean. And the storm brews up, and Jesus shows up and, and uh, uh, saves the disciples. In fact, I want you to turn for one second. I just noticed this for the first time, I think, this week. Uh, turn to uh, John 6, verse, um, verse 20. Uh, of course, the disciples have seen Jesus walking. It's dark, you know, walking on the water. They thought he maybe was a ghost. In verse 20, he said to them, It is thy, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. And listen, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. I mean, the boat trans transformed in three, three and a half, four miles in an instant. That never makes the press, but it should. That's a pretty amazing miracle too. Instantly the boat was there. Yeah, it's rather remarkable to think about, but that's neither here nor there for this sermon. So, long story short, I say this again because it's not short. Um, Jesus, trying to get by himself, it doesn't work. 